So we'll have a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless our time together around the Word. Father, we just thank you for your Word. We thank you that it's life and uh, uh, bread to uh, our spirits. Father, I ask that you would break it for us uh, this morning. Lord, I ask that your Holy Spirit would just speak through me and that we bind every evil influence, Lord, that would try and stop this Word. Father, we just thank you that these lips of clay are going to speak forth in clarity and in truth and people are going to be blessed through these lips. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Let it be. Okay. Well, we started off this morning um, looking at John chapter 12. And I'm going to read that out again. And that will be our text. Uh, John 12, 24, it says, Verily I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it'll live alone. But if it die, it'll bring forth much fruit. And he that loves his life shall lose it. Mm -hmm. Now remember that, that when we're, we're talking about that life, it's really the soulish life. It's not the spirit life. Jesus is actually making a distinction here between a soulish life, losing your uh, life here on earth. That is the selfish life that people live. So what he's saying is that when you start to swap your selfishness for the life that he's designed for you. You know, you understand that in heaven, heaven's uh, uh, or the kingdom of God's completely different than the kingdom that is now running on the earth. And what's happening is that you are a seed that's been planted in the world. Let's have a look at First uh, Peter. We need to understand that you're a seed and that you come from royalty that uh, you were begotten by a king and that word uh, you were you, you were not only sent into this earth uh, to be a righteous vessel we'll get to that in a sec you were made the righteousness of God let's have a look in first Peter chapter uh, chapter 1 and verse 23 it says we were born again not of a corruptible seed now that corruption or that corruptible seed is what you were first born with the corruptible seed was was given to you from adam and it's and paul talks about that he says we're living in a body that's growing old now you you can't help that that was passed on to you 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 uh, in essence you got a diseased body that was full of death and what's going to happen is that if you're born into this world in the flesh you're going to die unless Jesus comes back and collects you beforehand you're going to die in this world but that's really just your house your physical housing and that's a corruptible house meaning that it's diseased and and uh, what's happening is that it's um, it's dying daily now the wonderful part about it for us as Christians is that God has injected himself into our spirits and it says, uh, I think it's in Romans, that, that that spirit inside of us or God's spirit can actually maintain and keep this corruptible thing alive. That's where we get healing from. The, the spirit of God can come in and he can regenerate parts. And Sid, Roth, uh, Sid Roth's program talks a lot about, you know, we were talking about the, the uh, regeneration of the lower bowel or the uh, small intestine. Uh, God can do this because uh, the spirit life is greater than the soulish life. And that's what's happen happening to you as you receive this word this morning. What's happening is that Jesus said, my spirits are words, uh, my words are spirit and they are life. Now I have received healing by words that have been spoken to me. Isn't that interesting? Not by medicine that's been given me or, or doctor's medicines but but people have spoken things to me and I've been healed by that now that's incredible if you think about it that that a word could come into you and actually uh, fix you physically now Lies was talking about it uh, that little girl who was speaking on Sid Roth 
Uh, she had a really bad sore throat, as I remember. And uh, Lies was listening to this little girl and she was praying for that sore throat. And suddenly uh, her throat started to loosen up and feel, feel better, as I, as I remember. Now, there was no physical uh, medicine given to her, but it was a seed that was planted into her or a word. Now, that shows me that words contain things. Words contain physical, uh, uh, sorry, spiritual properties that can change physical things. Now, it's interesting. Your words contain spiritual properties too. Now, sometimes people are using their words negatively against themselves. They're, uh, they're actually saying things about themselves and they're cursing themselves. They're actually saying, well, I'll never amount to anything. Uh, my life's useless, my life's hopeless, those kind of things. Now, your spirit is actually listening to those words and that's an image that's being put into your, into your spirit and into your soul. And that's being planted. So every word, now, have you understood that every word that you speak, you're going to be accountable for, you'd probably shut up for a little while. So what's happening is that you are speaking your destiny you're planting seeds that are going to plant your life. Now, James talks about that. He says that your tongue is like a rudder. And we're talking a little bit of, about that. So that, that you, what you say about yourself and about others is going to determine your future. And so if you want to change your future, what have you got to change? You've got to change your words. It's not a matter of getting... Now, you can get a really great education and that kind of stuff. But if you are speaking negatively, now a lot of people have got great educations, they've got lots of, lots of things going for them uh, intellectually, and yet they're still failures. They're still failing. And uh, in an essence, they haven't left the world system because their words are holding them bondage into, in, in that system. So what God does is he sends another seed inside of us, and this is the seed that Peter's talking about. Uh, about. Uh, verse 23 of uh, First Peter, it says, We were born again, not of a corruptible seed, but an incorruptible seed by the word of God or in the word of God. So the word of God created something on the inside of you. And that's what we're talking about. The word has the power to go inside of you and create Now, uh, Peter talks about the difference between the flesh. Uh, he says, he goes on, he says that the word of God's going to continue forever, but the flesh is like the grass and all the glory of men. And the thing about flowers is that what happens to them? They die. So he's using this illustration of the creation that's under the dominion of death. What's happening is it's dying. So you can be a great achiever in sport, in, in lots of things, but eventually what's going to hap have to happen, I was looking at the tennis last night, uh, I was looking at uh, Nadal playing uh, Hess. Uh, now Hess is 30, and what they were saying is he's extremely fit, but uh, their point was for a tennis player, he's very old. Now I'm thinking 30, man, that guy's young. But for a tennis player, he's, he's, he's pretty mature. And it's the same as footballers. Uh, you know, a lot of times they'll retire them around about 30. Why? Because they can no longer keep up and their reaction time is no longer as quick as those that are younger. So you can get a great achievement as, as a person in the flesh. You might be a, a gifted athlete, uh, a gifted artist, but all that's at one time is going to die. Now, one of the sad things that I've seen uh, in my own life is looking at relatives that, that at one time, uh, recently, I was uh, at a, a particular person's uh, wedding and I had a relative who used to be, you know, in a sense, I, as a young boy, I used to look up to him and I think, man, uh, he's really got a, a grip on life. But I was looking at him and uh, I was talking to him, and this uncle of mine had actually, he didn't recognise me. And uh, I thought, oh, this is, this is a little bit strange, because um, generally he's right on the ball, pretty, 
pretty clued up. And I realised that what was happening was to this man who I'd, uh, you know, I wanted to aspire to, suddenly I saw him withering uh, before my eyes. The recognition that he had was starting to die and his faculties were starting uh, to be lost. And, uh, and this, this is the problem. When you base your life on uh, corruptible things, it's only temporary. But what you can do is you can actually change uh, from that temporary lifestyle and change to something that's eternal. Uh, but what you have to do is you have to receive this seed that's coming from heaven, from the kingdom. You have to live by that seed. If you're going to, to, uh, if you're going to sow to eternal life, uh, you have to sow in the spirit realm. You can't sow in the flesh and get eternal results. And that's what uh, Peter's saying. He's saying if you continue to sow in the flesh, uh, of the flesh, what are you going to reap? Corruption or death. That's right. And so what we have to do, if we're going to live eternally, we've, we're going to make impressions uh, in, in the world eternally. We have to swap from this fleshly thing to the spirit. Now, this is exactly what Jesus is talking about when he says you have to lose your life if you're going to find it. So if he's saying you have to lose your soulish life, what he's saying is that if, you, if you're prepared to lose your soulish life, now your soulish or your, uh, your psyche is all about who? Yourself. And the spirit world is, in an essence, outside of you. And so what you have to do is you have to swap from being self or self-conscious to being God conscious. You have to be uh, swapped from the kingdom of selfishness, as Pete said, to the kingdom of love. And of course, if you've been brought up uh, in a corruptible world, this world's built on selfishness. You were taught to be selfish. You know, we were talking about, <laughs> we were talking about that adverse advertisement from Deacon. Put yourself first. Go to Deakin University. Sorry, Deakin University. You can't sue me. I saw it. Um, put yourself first. Well, that's the kingdom of this world. It's all about putting yourself first and putting others last. God's kingdom, however, is always about putting others first and putting yourself last. Now, that is not very appealing to your soul. So you can understand that in essence your soul will have to die if you are going to live in the spirit. You have to come to a point where you're willing to lose that selfish life and swap it to the kingdom life. Now, uh, I want you to go over to 1 John. Okay, 1 John 4.16. You know, one of the predominant things about the kingdom of death is that it's all based... Now, selfishness is all based on fear, right? Uh, so, so the reason we don't do things, you know, uh, a lot of times if, if the Lord asks me to do something, the first thing that pops in your mind is how is this going to affect me and my life. Now Jesus told a parable about there was a particular uh, Pharisee. He, now he was a doctor of the law, meaning that he was in a very uh, he was very high up in the Jewish nation, and he was talking to Jesus. And Jesus had just um, uh, had a bit of a chat, and uh, of course the Pharisees didn't like Jesus uh, because he rattled their cage, so to speak. He rattled what they believed. And this particular, he was a doctor of the law, if you like. He was a very, uh, Queen's Counselor? How's that sound? He w oh, whatever. He was right up there. And uh, he challenged Jesus. He said, oh, well, Jesus, what do you think the most important, um, you know, what do you think the most important uh, uh, scripture is? And, uh, of course, Jesus Jesus knew what he was on about. What he was doing is trying to trick him uh, because he protected the law. These guys were meant to protect the law that Moses had given, make sure that, that no one was teaching contrary to it. And uh, actually, if we have a look there, let's, let's see if we can look there. Luke 10, 25. 
We'll come back to, hopefully we'll come back to John. It's a big ask. It says this, behold, how we going? Just say so praise the Lord if you got there. Oh, that seems so long in the two. Yeah. Anyway, there now. This is in Luke 10.25. Now, if you can't keep up, that's okay. Just have a listen. And it says, on Behold, or look, there was a certain, this is Jesus speaking, there was a certain lawyer stood up and he was tempting Jesus and said, uh, Master or teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Now, that sounds like a really good question, doesn't it? What should I do that I could have this eternal life? But we read on, and he said he wasn't really interested in that. He said this, uh, and he said unto him, he said, uh, well, what's written in the law? How do you understand it? That's a good way to answer someone's question. Answer it with a question. Well, what do you think? Uh, you know, unless it's obvious, an obvious kind of statement, like, is Collingwood the best footy team? Well, there's an obvious answer there. Um, do you think it is? <laughs> And he answered, this is the lawyer answering, he said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. And then this guy gets convicted, meaning that Jesus had located him. So he was asking out of selfishness. He, he was really... He was really um, asking with a, with a bad motive. He wasn't really interested in eternal life. He was trying to trick Jesus. And then Jesus answers him and says, well, what do you think? And the, uh, and the guy says, that, uh, says this answer, which is a really great answer, but he gets convicted through his own answer. Um, and he said unto him, thou hast answered right. So this is Jesus saying, you've done a good job there. Do this and you'll live. And suddenly the guy's convicted because he's obviously not doing it. Uh, so he wished at that moment that he'd shut his mouth and never asked Jesus this question because now he's got himself tangled up in this commitment thing. You know, never ask questions if you don't want to get committed. But, and it says in verse 20, willing to justify or put himself right and make himself sound like he was doing the right thing. He said unto Jesus, well, <laughs> well, who is my neighbor? In the Jerry Seinfeld kind of, ha, ah, what, what? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered him and said, and he began to tell him a story then. He said, um, there was a certain man who went down to Jerusalem, uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now this, uh, if you're going down Jerusalem to Jericho, it's a really steep incline, um, so many feet under the uh, sea level, under sea level. So it's a really rocky terrain. It's a really great place for robbers to hang out, you know, because you can't see them. Uh, you guys aren't, uh, you didn't watch Cowdies as kids, so you probably don't understand that. But Cowdies, uh, you know, robbers on Cowdies, cowboys and Indians, always hood, uh, hid behind rocks and crevices and then they'd pop up and you know. okay moving right along man this is this is tough now people hide behind planets it's it's just doesn't work um Star Wars. um and fell amongst thieves we, uh, so we went down to, to jerusalem from jerusalem we'll get right to jericho and fell amongst thieves which stripped him of his clothes, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a priest. Okay, here's a person who goes to church that way and he saw him. Guess what he did? He left him. He passed on the other side. What was he? Why would he pass on the other side? Yes, look, if you pass on the other side, at me, if you get within three feet, you're committed to helping. Okay, if you, you aren't past five metres, well, you're exempt from helping. So, this, this guy was a priest in verse 31. And likewise, a Levite, a similar kind of guy, 
uh, from the tribe of Levi, I suppose, uh, came and looked at him and passed by on the other side as well. But a, Samarit- a certain Samaritan, as he was journeying, came where he was, and when he looked on him, he had compassion on him. Now, we have to understand that the Samaritan, Samaritan people were hated by the Jews because they were a mixed race. The Jews, uh, you know, what they did was they, they were proud of the fact that they descended from Abraham and they weren't mixed. The Samaritans were half Jewish and half another race. And so, of course, they worshipped uh, another god as well. And so the Jews they really despised Samaritans. So what Jesus is doing is, is providing a comparison because the priest and the Levite were both Jews and probably outstanding Jews. But here they are passing on the other side. And here's a stinky Samaritan, so to speak, um, in the Jewish eyes, coming over and looking on him and feeling compassion. Now, that's not feeling sorry. Feeling sorry is like, gee, isn't it, isn't it sad that that guy's been beaten up and all these things have been taken from him? And then saying, oh, well, and then trooping off. You see, that's, oh, I sympathise with him. Compassion's not like that. Compassion's a movement. It's where you actually do something. Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a feeling that moves you. Sympathy is where you feel for the person, but there's no corresponding actions. So this person had compassion on him, and he went to him and bound up his wounds and poured in oil and wine and set him on his own beast. Isn't that interesting? Using his own resources there. And brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow, or was the next day, he departed. But he took out two pence and he gave, uh, gave it to the person who was looking after the inn and said, listen, take care of this guy and whatever extra you spend on him, when I come back here, pardon me, I'll repay everything that was owed to you. And then he says, which of these three, uh, these three think that, um, thinkest thou, was the neighbour under him that fell amongst the thieves? And of course the, the, uh, the lawyer said, well obviously it was he that showed mercy. And then Jesus said, go and do thou likewise. Okay, so what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about rules of engagement in the kingdom. You see, uh, the, way, the way that we lose our soulish life, see, both, both the Levite and the priest refused to lose their life, didn't they? But they were still going to church. And so our conclusion is that you could go to church, uh, you know, every day of your life and still be living, if you like, a soulish life. Our soulish Christians are Christians that have never, ever grown up. The, the Corinthian Christians were soulish Christians. Why? Because they never ever got to a point where they lost their lives. They refused to lose their lives for the kingdom. And so, of course, the problem with being a soulish Christian, and we've said this numerous times, is that you can't get what's uh, you can't get your inheritance. Now, one of the things that God's asked you to do. Um, just reflecting back, when I first became a Christian, I fa- found out that God saw me as perfect. That's the righteousness message. That means that God has nothing. He's n- when he looks at me, he doesn't look in a fault-finding way. And when I look at sis, I try to be like that. But she, she presents challenges. <laughs> God has asked us to look at others exactly the same way. Now, at the start, when I found out that God saw me as being perfect, now, you know, no, you've heard that saying, no one's perfect. Well, God looks at you, but he doesn't look at your mistakes. He looks at you the way that he created you. And he sees you as perfect. He sees you, uh, if you like, fully matured and fully grown. And he treats you that way. So he comes up... When, I, when, when someone is looking at you in a righteous manner or, or, or through the eyes of righteousness and they see you as righteous, they're not fault-finding. Now, there's some people I don't like to be around because what they do is they fault-find. They're finding, they're finding problems in me all the time. 
And, and the, the problem is if you don't feel acceptable, uh, then you're not ever going to ful- fulfill your potential. Now, you've heard of the word so, uh, low self-esteem, haven't you? People have low self-esteem. Well, that's a low self-estimate. Esteem and estimate are kind of basically the same word. So if you have low self-esteem, you've got a low estimate of yourself. Now, if you've got a low estimate of yourself, as you think, right, we were talking about this before, whatever you think about yourself, you're going to actually start acting out. Now, I found that when God started, when I started thinking that God loved me just the way I was, I started to get a confidence about me. Now, (laughs) here's the thing. When you start to understand your righteousness and you start to act the way that God sees you, there's going to be a problem. Can anyone think of what that problem is going to be? Well, you're going to run into people who have a different estimate of you. See, God's saying, I can't see your mistakes, but you're going to have people around you that continually see your mistakes. And so what's going to ha- happen is that they're, they're, you're going to have a conflict of evidence. You're going to have God saying that you're perfect, but people are going to be reminding you about your problems. You see? And so what you have to do is you have to make a decision who you're going to believe. Am I going to believe that God sees me as righteous or am I going to believe these people? Now, there's another thing that goes into action. What I found was that when I started believing what God said about me, not only did my estimate change of myself, but my behavior changed. Now, that's when it starts to get very interesting. When your behavior starts to change in this world system, what you're going to do is you're going to start to challenge things. Does that make sense? When you start to get a new estimate of yourself, a new self-esteem, a new thought about, uh, about how God sees you and that you're loved and that you're cared for, what, what's going to happen is you're going to come into conflict with, with another kingdom. Now, it's the kingdom, and we're going to look at these two kingdoms. We haven't got a lot of time today, but let's go to Romans chapter... Five, Romans. Yeah, Romans chapter five. Now we need to understand that the kingdom of darkness, if you like, the opposing kingdom of selfishness, has a a, a thread that binds everyone together. Let's see if you can pick it in Romans five seventeen. For by one man's offence, death began to reign in humanity. Who was that one man? Adam. Adam made death. He passed that disease on to you many generations ago. Much more they which receive the abundance of God's favour. And here it is, the gift of righteousness. Now, how do you get right with God? You have to receive it. You can't work to get good with, with God. Now, you can work to get good with other people. You can, <laughs> you can perform, but you can't do that with God. God says, no, nah, sorry, all your performance doesn't affect me. I just love you the way you are, Lois. You don't have to do anything to get my love. I just love you. So you no longer have to work f- for love. Once you meet God, God says, you don't have to work for my love. I love you just the way you are. And of course... What's everyone looking for? Love just the way you are. You see, you don't have to work to earn that love. And that's a wonderful thing. He sees you as righteous. He sees you as perfect. Therefore, I love you just the way you are. Now, what takes place is when you start to receive this gift, what do you begin to do? It tells you in verse 17. Someone read that out for me so you don't think I'm telling fibs. Anyone? 578? Yeah? Uh, 
Right. Now, you'll notice that that rain there isn't R-A-I-N. It's R-E-I-G-N. And what do we, what do we get about raining? What's, who, who reigns? Kings. Kings. God reigns. He's a king. Now, Paul's saying something very significant about you. He's saying you were born as a ruler or a king. And that righteousness will make you a ruler. Now, no one told me about this. I didn't understand that when I received righteousness, immediately I would become a ruler. Now, one of the problems with some kings is that they're born kings, but when they get to about 21, 22... Some of them realize that there's a whole lot of responsibility with their lifestyle. And so what do they do? Run away, run away. (laughs) They run away. That's right. Because they didn't realize that along with this, this unconditional love, there was going to be a responsibility. And that responsibility was to reign or to rule. Now, Adam allowed what to rule? We found out in that verse what he allowed death. Now, the implication here is when you receive Jesus Christ into your life, what are you going to do? You're going to rule over? You're going to rule over death. Now, what does that immediately say in your life? There's going to be, well, there's going to be life. What are you going to have to do? Make decisions to rule over what? Death. So immediately in being born into this kingdom, there's going to be conflict, you see. And that's something that that I didn't realize, that righteousness, the righteousness that I received was going to take me into conflict. And I was going to be, uh, straight away, I was going to be thrust into conflict with death. Now, the thing about you is that you have a life inside of you that is able to rule over death. When you become kingdom-minded, what's going to happen is death is going to be dispelled. But here's the trick. Do you want to become kingdom-minded? Because once you start to become kingdom-minded, death is going to flee. You were left as a seed into this world to grow up and become a dominant force. Part of your Christian life is to dominate and rule. Now, to do that wisely, what we have to do is we have to put a kingly mentality in you. You have to learn to rule as a king. Now, it's not enough to be born as a king. That's great. Because what happens when you're born as a king is you get all this wealth that you didn't earn. But here's the thing. Uh, We were talking about rock stars who inherit wealth before. And uh, a lot of them get wealth very quickly. And the only problem is that they haven't learned to deal with it. And so along with this kingly position of being born as a king, you have to learn to rule as a king. And that's why you're coming here every Sunday is because you're coming to learn how to rule and reign as a king in life. And you need to be educated in your wealth. And as you become more educated in your wealth, what happens is that God begins to release that wealth to you. So the more... In a sense, the more educated you are as a king and and start to rule and reign as a king, the more wealth I can give to you as, as, as as, if you like, as the father of the king. The more more I can release my kingdom to you, the uh, the greater responsibility you show in your kingdom lifestyle, the more kingdom... I can release and the more battles I can send you into. Now we already know, do we send our weakest soldiers into battle or our strongest? Come on guys, World of Warcraft? What are we going? Are you oh okay, yeah. Well that's oh great. That didn't work, did it? Well obviously that's the kingdom of darkness. You know, let's send the weakest in first and, and save ourselves for the big battle. If they get if they get murdered and killed, well ha. Huh. We'll grow some more. Oh, <laughs> we'll grow. Okay, we're not using World of Warcraft. <laughs> this is no good. Okay, let's finish with um, the scripture in Galatians. 
So Galatians. So what we're doing is we're trying to educate you to be the kings that you are. We need to put inside of you a kingly mentality so that you can begin to rule and reign over the kingdom of darkness and dispel it. But if you haven't got that, that kingdom mentality and that thought process of a king, what's going to happen is that that kingdom of darkness will rule over you. Okay, so we're in Galatians and we're looking at Galatians chapter 4. Some exciting things happening in church. People are receiving real estate. This is wonderful. So we're seeing people ca come into a place where they're beginning to receive their inheritance, beginning dis to dispel darkness, kingdoms, and take territory. That's a significant thing in the life of a church. Real estate is important. I didn't, I didn't used to think that, but real estate's really important uh, because Satan is running this world through real estate, through corporations, that kind of stuff. Now, the problem is that the, the church is inverted. We've been going to the world to get permission to see whether we can live. And what's going to ha happen is that we've got to change that round so that we can uh, start telling the world how to live. We've got to start dominating over the world. Now, w w when we say dominate, we use that in, in the right way. When love's in rulership, we're not going to be making bad decisions. We're not going to be sending our little men in to get killed first, are we? You know, a really good uh, king doesn't do that. No one's expendable. And a, a good king would lead his army into battle, wouldn't, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, man. <laughs> Let's not even go there. Okay, so here we have in uh, Galatians chapter 4, it says this, that a king, we could say, this is verse 1, that a king... Now, what do we say? That in righteousness we're heirs. So let's use the word king instead of heir. That a king, as long as he's a child, dith differs, differs, differs nothing from a servant, though he be king of everything or lord of everything. But he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of who? His dad. Even so, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. So where's the, what's the implication there? That if you're a child, what's going to ha happen? You'll be dominated by the world. Childish Christians are dominated by the world. They're really, in essence, no use kingdom-wise. So they have to be renewed in their mind. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem those that were under the law that they might receive sonship. Uh, now it goes on um, over the page. It says, oh, over the page, verse 7, it says, Wherefore you are no longer a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Jesus Christ. The implication or the understanding... Now, he's talking about the Jews there a, a, as a nation, saying that when they came to a specific time, they, they came off the law, which was babyhood, and they went into faith in Jesus Christ. But there's a double implication here. It's talking about Christians who are, who are, not, uh, who are not renewed to their ruling capacity. Where you're a, 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 a passive Christian who uh, is, 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 if you like, being ruled by the mechanism and by the thought process of the world, you'll never ever get to a stage where you take real estate, either we're talking land, but we're also talking people. You'll never ever come to a place where you take the enemy's loot. So you have to go in and bind the strong man if you're going to take his, uh, spoil his goods. So we have to be at a point where we can displace strong men. 
So you have to grow up to a stage where, in, in, in essence, intellectually, you can, you can fight against a strong man and displace him. Now, here's the thing, that if you do that, what will happen is the people who were under that strong man will then gravitate to who? To you. That's why Jesus could say, I will make you fishers of men. Jesus will teach you how to catch men, which is really the most important real estate in the world. Jesus will teach you how to catch men. Now, you can't catch him. Uh, you know, Pete was talking about that guy who tried to catch Pete, who came along and didn't give him any good news. <laughs> he was, um, I don't know, he was, uh, did he say he was a Christian or? Oh, okay. Anyway, the long and the short of it was he wasn't very appealing to you, Pete. So he didn't, he couldn't take the strong man out of your life. He couldn't displace the strong man. Now, you have to get to a stage where you're prosperous enough in your soul to be able to take the strong man down, to displace, if you like, strongholds in people's lives. You have to be an equal match. Now, that's a process of time. Now, at the moment, Jesus is making you a fisher of men. Uh, it's interesting. He doesn't only say, go out and preach the gospel. That's part of it. But he all want, uh, also wants you to have a character that will deal with the strongholds and the principalities that are behind the capture of those men. See, the gates of hell are really keeping people in. And they're trying to keep you out, but if you can open up the gates of hell, what will you take? You'll take the spoil, which is, which is people. You know, Jericho was keeping people in. Those, those walls and that. When the people were marching around, what were they trying to do? Well, they were trying to get in to the gates, if you like. They were trying to get into that city to take the spoil. God had asked them, he said, you know, and he did a, a, a specific way. So God's asking you to take the spoil in the world. But you have to do it a specific way. One of the ways is that you have to have a kingly mindset. You have to have a true estimation of yourself. You can't think like a worm. And, and, and be a true representative of God. You can't think like a chicken, you know, where, where are chickens? That, well, you know, to use that illustration, they're running around the chicken, the chicken pen. If you're an eagle and you're brought up as a chicken, uh, you're going to feel pretty, pretty well uh, kind of, you're not going to fit in very well, are you? But when you, once you start to get your eagle mentality going, what's going to hap have to happen to the chicken pen? You, it's got to go. You've got to get out there and start soaring like an eagle. If you've been born an eagle, which you have, if you've been born an eagle, you've got to start acting like an eagle. You're going to feel frustrated if you're down acting like a chicken in a chicken pen. And so you have to have a true estimation of what God thinks of you so that you can begin to soar in the destiny that he's created for you. You have to start thinking in terms of what God thinks of you. You have to start to get this regal mindset, this kingly mindset, and then you'll be a... See, if you, unless you come to a point where you start to think like a king... See, what do kings do? They don't go and dig holes. What do they do? They say, hey, we need a hole dug here. They decree things. So you need to have an estimate of... See, until you get an estimate, a true estimate of yourself, you're not going to start acting the way that God wants you to act. And so the more estimate that you have of yourself, the greater the estimate uh, of yourself, and the, and the more renewed you become to God's estimate of you, the more you're going to be able to seize of Satan's kingdom. So that's directly related to your soul. And one of the mechanisms here uh, that Jesus talks about is letting go of your soulish life, letting go of your chicken mentality, if we could use that, and starting to get your eagle mentality going. Part of that is letting go of your life. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Let's finish. Father, we just thank you for this word. We praise you for uh, this renewal of our minds and the fact that we can start to get the true estimate of who we are and uh, the way that you think about us, the way you love us, the way you care about us. 
And Father, I just ask now that you would uh, plant the seed in people and, and that this week we're going to see signs and wonders following this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.